Welcome back to the third hour of our show. You know, sometimes you know what you know, and sometimes you know what you don't know, and sometimes you don't know what you do know, and sometimes you don't know what you don't know, and sometimes, well, as the first one theater says, You know that you're wrong, but you fear you're right. You suspect you're out of sync. You think that you're out of your mind. Everything you know is wrong. Could it be everything you know is wrong about the recession and sex stuff? Dr. David Snarsh is with us. He is the author of... Passionate marriage, keeping love and intimacy alive in committed relationships. He's also a licensed clinical psychologist, certified sex therapist, and directs the Marriage and Family Health Center in Evergreen, Colorado. Uh, Dr. Snarsh, welcome to the program. Hey, Tom, it's a pleasure to be with you. One in three moms. I, I just saw this survey over at uh, momlogic.com, and they did a survey of their of their participant members, I guess. And one in three moms are turning to vices like overeating, drinking, drugs, and gambling to cope with the recession. 64% of moms feel intensively negative emotions. 50% are less, less satisfied with their lives now than before the economic downturn. One in four are having less sex with their partners. 27% of moms 25, 34 years old uh, want to have more children but are holding off because of the recession. These are, you know, 80% claim that they feel overwhelmed. 50% say they spend more time fighting and less time having sex. Um, is the economic recession going to lead to the end of our species? I mean, are we going to stop producing kids? I mean, some population advocates are arguably would say that would be a good thing, but in any case, what's going on here? Well, I, I think normal people are hit hard by the economic times, not just financially, but also their sense of self-worth, their desirability. A lot of us get our sense of self-worth by our ability to make money, the clothes that we can buy. And what generally happens when couples are under stress is either they start taking it out on each other or they start withdrawing from each other, and that's a sex killer. Mm. Absolutely. Yeah. You know that... Uh I've I've lost the data here. You had you had some rather startling statistics on on uh, people's relationships, married couples oh, in America. Yeah, they they sound as dismal as what you were reading about uh, parenting and motherhood. We had ten thousand people come on our website at passionatemarriage.com and tell us about the, what their sex life was like. Sixteen mm. percent said sex was dead. Thirty four percent said their sex was comatose and in danger of dying, and 28% said their sex was asleep and needing a wake-up call, which, if you do the math, says 80% of 10,000 people are saying sex isn't worth taking off their clothes. Wow. So, A, I mean, there's, you can think of biological reasons why this is not a good thing. I mean, for example, the, the number of times a man has sex in his life is reciprocal to the probability of his getting prostate cancer. The more often he has sex, the less likely it is he'll end up with prostate cancer. Mm -hmm. And and I'm assuming, and I know that there have been some studies that indicate that that women who have sex are less likely to be depressed. Apparently, there's uh, something in the hormones or something in the zinc and semen that actually acts as an antidepressant for women. Uh, you know, that comes from men. But you know, setting aside even the biological arguments or the medical arguments in fa favor of having more sex, how, you know, how do people push through that stuff? Well, what's real common is people just get divorced. They think that if you're in love or you really are sexually attracted to your partner, you're going to want to be getting into bed all the time. And that's not the way that marriage works. So one of the advantages of my book, Passionate Marriage, is it tells you what normal people do, just like the statistics. So one of the things that we point out is sexual relationships always consist of leftovers. You get to decide what you don't want to do. Your partner gets to decide what they don't want to do. And you do what's ever left over. And you do that for five years, guaranteed you're going to be bored senseless. And mm. people don't anticipate that their own marriage is going to push them out of their comfort zone, just like a lot of people are finding that the economy is pushing them out of their comfort zone. So, and so, so you're, you're suggesting that people should be pushing beyond their own comfort zone, that, that they should go beyond... Uh, in their in their relationship, in their intimate relationship, they should go beyond what they're comfortable with. Well, you're not going to get a choice. Intentionally. E exactly. You're not going to get a choice because you're either going to be bored senseless or you have to stand up and eventually show your partner a side of yourself that you've been hiding or you got to step out into the unknown and begin to do things between the two of you that uh, would normally make you uncomfortable. So is it time to get out the fuzzy handcuffs or whatever, you know, the, the, the kinky things, you know, with the whips and chains or whatever? I mean, is Oh, well, you, don't need, toys. You, don't, you don't have to get into kink. For a lot of people, it's just, for instance, uh, showing a part of your, yourself to your partner like you like different sexual behaviors that you may not have done or you may have been uncomfortable about. Mm. Or you just show, for instance, women begin to show that, uh, yes, they like the loving and the intimacy, but they 
also have a carnal side, and for a lot of guys, it's showing that they're willing to be held and they want more tenderness. And that that's very frightening to people to do, but I think yeah. that's also good preparation for also becoming a parent as well. You don't get to stay safe and secure if you're going to be a parent. There are going to be a lot of things that are going to scare you, and you got to learn to hold on to yourself and regulate your anxiety and not take everything personally, and that's also what's really good for dealing with the economy, about learning not to take it personally because all of a sudden you're in a tight bind and not taking your anxiety out on your partner. So the same things that work for sex work for parenting. They work for handling economic hardship, dealing with uh, death in a family. And that's, I think, one of the beauties about dealing with sex. What you do in your relationship with your partner is not limited to the bedroom. It teaches you lessons all about life. And that's why uh, basically 300,000 people have bought copies of Passionate Marriage. Right. We're talking with Dr. David Snarsh. He's the author of Passionate Marriage. Yeah. PassionateMarriage.com is the website. And uh, I, in... In the uh, news, I haven't read the book. I'm sorry. I, I've, I've thumbed. Through, I've spent a little time with it this morning, but mm -hmm. uh, I, I did read the material that came along with it, which included a lot of excerpts. And one that I thought was particularly interesting was the idea of uh, people, a couple, just. And, and I'm assuming that this would apply to, in your mind, it certainly would in mind to to gay couples as well as straight couples. But just the idea of a couple holding each other until both are completely relaxed can be something. Is something that people typically don't do and right. can break and causes a, a, a breakthrough into a level of intimacy that most people are not familiar with. Oh, absolutely, Tom. There are lots of people who don't feel each other when they touch each other. It's one of the reasons why they stop having sex, because it feels so lonely while you're doing what's supposed to be the most intimate thing that two people can do. So there's something in the middle of the book, which is Tools for Connection, called Hugging to Relax. The average mm -hmm. hug lasts four seconds. And hugging to relax is simply you keep your clothes on, your feet on the floor, you put your arms around your partner, you focus on yourself, and you calm yourself down so you give your partner someone relaxed to hold. And you do that for about five or ten minutes, and it uh, starts doing things like really making you feel appreciated, and it also makes you wonder why your partner really wants to hold you. You can usually understand why your partner wants to have sex with you, but hugging to relax really brings couples together in a way that very often having intercourse doesn't, because really good sex isn't just about elevating your heart rate, it's about elevating your heart. Amazing. Dr. David Snarch, PassionateMarriage.com, the website, Passionate Marriage, the book. Thank you, sir, for dropping by today. Thank you for having me, Tom. Uh, for our Everything You Know Is Wrong segment. And uh, now, back to, back to politics. In the United States Senate, Sheldon Whitehouse is uh, interviewing the guy who, who questioned Abu Zubaydah, the interrogator. And here's a, a clip from September that. September 6, 2006, President Bush stated the following. Within months of September 11, 2001, we captured a man named Abu Zubaydah. We believed that Zubaydah was a senior terrorist leader and a trusted associate of Osama bin Laden. Zubaydah was severely wounded during the firefight that brought him into custody, and he survived only because of the medical care arranged by the CIA. Now, all of that stuff, it turns out, with that Bush said, that Sheldon Whitehouse, Senator, Senator Whitehouse is quoting, was true. Now come the lies. After he recovered, Zubaida was defiant and evasive. Turns out that was a lie. Actually, Zubaida was very helpful. He declared his hatred of America. Actually, that was a lie. During questioning, he at first disclosed what he thought was nominal, nominal information. And another lie from this. So this is Senator Whitehouse quoting George W. Bush's statement about the interrogation of Zubaida. It turns out that during, as they were nursing Zubaida back to health, when it was just the FBI interrogating him, or this, you know, be, long before they started torturing him, that's when he gave them the name of Khalid Sheikh Mohammed, the mastermind of 9/11. And then stopped all cooperation. We knew that Zubaydah had more information that could save innocent lives, but he stopped talking. As his questioning proceeded, it became clear that Zubaydah had received training on how to resist interrogation, and so the CIA used an alternative alternative set of procedures. Does that statement by the president accurately reflect? the interrogation of Abu Zubaydah. Well, and, and now his interrogator responds. Is, did, did George W. Bush tell the truth when he told this to the American people? And here is uh, Mr. Sufan, the, the uh, CIA interrogator. The interrogation of Abu Zubaydah. Well, the environment that he's talking about, yes, it reflects, you know, he was injured and he needed medical care. But I think uh, uh, the president, my own personal opinion here, 
based on my recollection, he was told probably half-truth. And repeated half-truth, obviously. The statement as presented does not conform with what you know to be the case from your experience on hand. Yes, sir. Yes, sir. George W. Bush. George W. Bush lied to the American people. Well, from sex to George W. Bush to lies. It's a pretty good segue. We'll be right back with your call. Stick around.